Hare Mai, and welcome to Cult Chat, the podcast where we talk about coercion, control, and all things cultish. I'm Dr. Caroline Ansley. I'm a medical doctor. As a child, I lived at the Centrepoint community, a notorious cult in New Zealand, and now I run a website that advocates for the former children of the community. I'm Liz Gregory, and I run the Glory of Our Leavers Support Trust, and I'm privileged to walk alongside people after leaving this group as they embark on their new lives. And I'm Lindy Jacob. I'm a former member of the Exclusive Brethren, and I'm part of the Olive Leaf Network, a new initiative in Aotearoa to support leavers of high-demand religious groups. Come with us as we unpack the cult playbook. We'll be talking to experts and leavers of coercively controlling groups, and we will call for Kiwis to cult-proof their lives. Come with us as we traverse the cultiverse. A warning, this podcast contains references to subjects and discussions which may be difficult for some people to hear. Please take care of yourselves and your whānau when listening. who's the author of the fantastic book, Cult Trip. She's bringing us an exciting event soon. Oh, kia ora. Get ready for DECOD, the first cult awareness conference in Aotearoa, New Zealand, happening in Christchurch this October. Well, that sounds great. Who's it for, Anka? Look, it's for anyone concerned about coercive control and trauma, but we're especially inviting health professionals, social workers, therapists, teachers, police, lawyers, pastors, and chaplains to upskill in cult education. These are the professional people who can make the biggest difference for cult survivors. Wonderful. I've been inviting all my medical friends to come along. There's going to be lots of content at Decult, which will be really interesting for them. Head to our website, decult.net, for all the info. See you at Decult 2024. Hello, everyone. It's nice to see you two again uh, after a little bit of a, a break. Uh, we're here to talk about what I think we all can agree is a pretty heavy topic. But before we start, we want to see where everyone is up to. How are you two going? Yeah, flat out. I think if you're on YouTube or any of our visual platforms, you'll see palm trees waving in the background. I'm not on a tropical beach at all, but perhaps I might like to be there. <laughs> you've, you've had a particularly full-on time in the last uh, six weeks or so, haven't you, Liz? Yeah, very much so, yes. It's been, um, it just seems like a lot of activity in the glory of our sphere, compounding, overlapping, a lot, a lot happening, along with people leaving. Uh, just um, support needs to increase across the region, so that involves education, it involves supporting um, people on different sides of the island, helping other network groups, like other social service organisations, to deliver good care services to leavers. Yeah, it's a lot, a lot of balls in the air. You feel like every day you're not sure which one you need to throw just a little higher just to stop something falling on the ground. So it is quite a high pressure, um, yeah, workload. But we're worth it because we're helping people, but there's just too much help needed. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lindy, where are you at? Yeah, no, things are busy here too, um, but it's it's exciting. We're really looking forward to um, uh, events here in New Zealand in October. So it's coming up close now with um, DCult just around the corner and then Olive Leaf Networks um, organising and hosting two events after that for training mental health therapists or other care providers of um, who have got clients who, who are former members of cult-like groups. So yeah, we've got over 70 therapists registered for um, one of our events, two-day training with Dr. Jilly Jenkinson, which I'm really excited about because it just tells me that there are um, over 70 therapists who recognise that this is an issue. It's an area where they need upskilling and they're taking advantage of Dr. Jilly being here in New Zealand for that. So I'm really pumped about that to think that there will be at least 70 therapists up and down Aotearoa after this who um, you know, I'm sure Dr. Dilly's training is obviously not a be or an end all when it's only two days, and yet um, it will be a really good introduction, I think, from, you know, she is an internationally recognised expert psychotherapist 
with a deep specialty in cult recovery. So yeah, that's really that's really cool to have those events just around the corner. So it's something positive, isn't it? When um yeah, tonight when we're looking at a heavy, dark topic and you know, a lot of retrospective looking back at New Zealand's history of some of the the harms and the problems and then as it does, you know, towards the end of our chat, I'm sure we'll, you know, turn our faces to the future again as well. Um and you know that's one of the questions we'll be asking is what can we do about this and how can we prevent it from happening and um yeah so i'm really excited wow. because i'm going to attend that uh, two-day training in christchurch and some of our staff are coming as well which is just amazing and then after that there's a whole lot of activity actually happening in this culty sphere and it involves um, taking Dr. Yanya Lalich after DCOP conference up to Wellington uh, with us and our trust and some other collaborative partners like the Olive Leaf Network <laughs> and um, heading to an event at Parliament for MPs and also some private meetings that we're going to have around the Gloria Vale issue. But really the parliamentary idea is to um, just bring this up to the awareness of those who are decision makers and potential lawmakers this issue of cold awareness and the harm that's done needs to be exposed and we need to be forward planning. So there'll be lots of asks and requests of government at, at those events, I'm sure. And then after that, another couple of weeks later, we have Dr. Yanya Lalich and Jilly Jenkinson coming to Timaru to run some special survivor workshops with Gloria Vale Leavers, also taking the opportunity for a public session where both of those people will be contributing. And we have a one-day training with Dr. Jilly for therapists, supporters, pastors, counsellors, just in our sort of South Canterbury region. So we're certainly all making use of these amazing people who are who are coming here to New Zealand. And you're right, the idea is future facing, isn't it? How can we mm. help support people through the recovery process to find mm. exciting? Mm. Yeah. Wow. Um, I've been I've been um doing a bit of work in the background as well. Um, you guys like just so I don't want you to leave me in your dust. How busy you both have been doing um, world changing things. Um, I've been trying very hard to get um, doctors to pay attention to doctors and nurses and uh, allied health and and all people working closely in the health space to um, notice this um, population of people who otherwise are fairly invisible. Mm. Um, we've said we've said before that uh, cult leavers are somewhat like refugees, and I think that's a really helpful model for health workers to to think about mm. um, because they understand refugees. Mm. And so um, I was recently interviewed for the Listener magazine uh, about four weeks ago, I think, and that was uh, it's a. You know, those who aren't in New Zealand, it's a sort of a weekly rag here, and it was good to get that out. And I also had an interview with um, Sarah Steele's podcast, Let's Talk About Sets, which is uh, an Australian-based podcast, which has quite a good, got a fairly good listenership. And I've had some contact from some people since then, um, sort of saying to me, "Yeah, this really moved me. Uh, this idea of healthcare need neglect." Um, so yeah, it feels like there's stuff happening. Uh, yes. For all of us, actually, so that's really exciting. That's amazing, Kaz. And can you chuck those links to the CSC interview and to the listener? Because yeah. I presume it's available online, uh, maybe only for subscribers. But chuck those links down there because um, that that is fantastic work. So yeah, kudos yeah. to you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, yeah, shall we move on? You also have some injury, isn't there? Some you know, oh. bent some older. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I did rupture my cruciate ligament skiing as well, so that put a in my right knee that put a real downer on my ski season can I say that yeah it's oh. always said exercise is just so bad for you you know like, yeah. you well, I wasn't I wasn't exercising it was it was um entirely uncontrolled turbo tor torpedo bulleting down a slope with uh, a ski still attached unfortunately which led to a, a pop in my knee joint so I am so sorry yeah <laughs> but I've joined a new club it's called the ruptured anterior cruciate ligament club which I didn't know existed before I did it now I know all about it oh I hope there's hope for your skiing future <laughs> yeah. anyway back on to the serious stuff um so today we're talking about something that I think many um, New Zealanders will be aware of and uh, maybe some of our international listeners will be aware um it's a tempting topic to shy away from we will be just highlighting to our listeners that today's episode will be talking about such things as sexual abuse and assault, uh, neglect, grooming, um, physical assault. In most cases, this will be about children. 
uh, young people or very vulnerable adults. It's distressing. We just want to emphasize the need to be careful if you're listening and to think about who's in the room with you and if this is the right time to be listening to this topic. Mm. Um, so we're bringing to the table the Royal Commission of Inquiry into Abuse and Faith-Based and State Care uh, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, which was established on the 1st of February 2018, the purpose to investigate uh, what happened to children, young people and adults in state care in the care of faith-based institution mm -hmm. in Aotearoa, New Zealand, between 1950 and 1999. Can I just say there with the proviso that the commission was allowed to continue on and up to um, current dates. Okay, great. So after seven years of the investigation, the final report, which is called Fanakitia. Uh, and the associated summaries and recommendations was released on 25th of June 2024, um, a couple of months ago. You can read the report yourself at www.abuseandcare.org.nz under the report section. Mm -hmm. So um, some and of you guys know a little bit more about the history of this than I do, if you want to jump in. Yes. Oh, well, I was just going to say that if you... Um, you know, if you do are so brave as to look it up, um, be warned, it is, it is hefty, which I think, you know, is actually really good because so it should be hefty. It should be comprehensive. You know, they interviewed over 3000 survivors and um, yeah, as well as survivors directly themselves, as well as family members and others who were former, former workers in some of these institutions or entities. So, um, and as you said, it, it covered a huge amount of time as well as up to you know taking information from people up to the present and mm. yeah it's been turned into a massive 16 volume report mm. um, but they, they've worked really hard as well to make it accessible to people so um, there are executive summaries available there are summaries of each of the volumes available it's you know um, available in large text and in, in braille and in, um, yeah so and there are also been multiple podcasts and news articles on it so if you can't face reading the whole thing yourself um, I do encourage you to check out one of the summaries or news articles around it if you haven't because it is a report that has got an impact in it for every New Zealander mm. and yeah it, it really does matter it's it's been a massive undertaking mm. and um, this is important yeah. Yeah, you said it was a hefty report, and it certainly was, because I was in Wellington, um, in the Beehive, on the day in June where the report was tabled, and it was such a moving experience. We were there with um, Bronwyn Kempf and Rosanna Overcomer, she's a survivor from Gloria Vale, along with a lot of other survivors from these groups, people that were harmed, and so we're in the public gallery, and when the time came for the report to be tabled, there were six people who came in, and they were in peers, and they were carrying, because it was so heavy between them, a sort of container of documents. Three lots came in and it got put on the table and they unpacked this container and it was 14 kilograms yeah. of our national disgrace. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I just had those tears that just sprang into my eyes because it was a visual reminder that, you know, some of our friends were in that report and what about all the other people whose names didn't make it, who, who weren't alive to tell their stories, who weren't there to share the pain and the impacts? And, and knowing that everyone who spoke up and contributed did it because they don't want this to happen again in our country. Mm -hmm. So I just found it incredibly moving. Um, the whole experience um, was quite incredible from turning up to Parliament and there was a, a, a welcoming um, and Māori song and welcome, and there were a group of people who walked a hekoi, a peace mm -hmm. march, you know, beforehand and came onto the grounds, and we were watching them. We were on the side that was sort of more welcoming, and we went into the entrance at, at government, and you have to go through screening, so you're sort of in the foyer for a little bit, and the group came through, and they were carrying like a big rope that had flags and banners and uh, ribbons on it. And they were the, on them were names of survived, uh, people who couldn't make it because they weren't alive anymore. Mm -hmm. And they came in and they sang, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And we all joined in. And I just could not hold back the tears. And that was just, we're just going through security. And then we, we got led through to the other side and into the Beehive, where a very moving um, um, afternoon of speeches was held across party. And I think most parties had two people speaking and there was a general sense of acceptance and shame. And, mm. and there were some apologies there, but the intention was that this was not the time for the official apologies. They will be coming um, later in, in November, but it was an, an 
a receiving of the commission, an official tabling, and then it went live for the public after that. And following that, there was a reception, um, drinks and nibbles, and it was wonderful to see the MPs and the Prime Minister and survivors and everyone mixing and mingling. And we had some very um, special uh, times with you know, Rosanna and the Prime Minister and, and others, just very attentive, wanting to talk about how was that for you and you know what would you like to see moving forward. And just, yeah, yeah. it was quite a special moment to be there. Mm. So, you know, to give a brief overview of what this what Whanaketia holds, and by the way, the name is very beautiful. It, it means through pain and trauma from darkness to light, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, that's a beautiful and idealistic um, name to hold out. But so at 16 volumes, do they, um, yeah, there's multiple survivor accounts. They, um, they cover all the contexts in which abuse occurred. So... Um, initially, when the when it was first commissioned, it was only going to be looking at abuse in state, um, in state care, so state entities and institutions. Um, but it soon became apparent so many survivors were coming forward, who were you know in this other space, who who were um, sometimes it was a state and a faith based entity like say um, a Catholic school or, um, you know, a Salvation Army care facility, so where the government had, the state had kind of handed over care to a faith-based entity, um, it became so apparent that so much abuse had happened in those spaces that, um, yeah, faith-based um, survivors of abuse and faith-based entities, you know, had to challenge and had to... Um, advocate for themselves to say hey we need to be included as well um mm -hmm. people who have been um counted as being in the care of a faith-based entity and might not directly um look like just a state entity but really the state had handed over care and entrusted care into these faith-based institutions we need to be the scope needs to be included mm -hmm. uh it's widened to include us too and so um it did open up can we give a shout out to liz tonks for that work she did, immense amount of work with a network of survivors, for survivors of abuse and faith-based institutions. She really led the charge of getting faith-based included in this report. And I connected in with her probably a year, a year later um, to yeah. work mm -hmm. with how we could get Gloria Vale involved. Well, I think it's particularly relevant when you consider that for much of the beginning of uh, last century and moving into the middle of the century, all of the sort of social service stuff was done by church-based, mm. um, faith-based institutions, and yeah. the government wasn't doing it. And that's what right. part of Fane Katia actually talks about. It opened things up, doesn't it? It opened it up to if it was if we're going to include all the orphanages run by the Catholics and the Anglicans and the Methodists, well, what's it look like when uh, it's less formal than that? Mm. It's in a pastoral care relationship, right. or in my in my case at Centre Point. I was just left at Centre Point. Oh, Centre Point will look after Caroline. Yes. So you know that's a classic example of a, a well, it was actually a foster care arrangement, or um, in uh, the 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 more official pastoral care scenario, it's the youth group leader, it's the mm -hmm. the vicar in the church, it's any and, and for instance, the two by twos is a great example. Nice. There's, there's these travelling ministers coming into the homes mm -hmm. of um, local, you know, parishioners who who now have this huge authority figure in their home, who of course they're going to defer enormously, uh, and that's a pastoral care relationship with high risk associated with it because they're in the home. Um, yeah. So so it's an it's an interesting one because um, yeah, obviously this didn't faith based entities didn't get included without a lot of um, pushbacks sometimes from the faith-based entities themselves yes. and especially around this thing of um yeah why should we be included um and um this question of does past does a pastoral care relationship mm -hmm. uh mean that yeah people or entities or, or the faith-based institutions can be held accountable for the care that took place because you know going back to the wider scope that was the scope of looking at care abuse and care and so we get these faith-based institutions saying oh no it wasn't really care that we were providing but the royal commission um you know pushed back and and said actually no this was this is a care relationship and you qualify for investigation yes so, so they chose eight in particular faith-based groups 
um, Catholic Church, Anglican Church, Salvation Army, Methodist Church, Presbyterian Church, Gloria Vale Christian Community, Plymouth Brethren Christian Church, and the Jehovah's Witnesses. And it took a lot of effort for us to get Gloria Vale Christian Community included. Right early on, we started having meetings. There were so many phone calls, letters, and it was quite a process to ensure that Gloria Vale wasn't forgotten because Gloria Vale isn't an institution that had, say, an issue in the past. It was so current that to leave it out would have just been an utter travesty. But without direct um, advocacy on behalf of leavers, it wouldn't have got off the ground because they were they didn't even know about the Royal Commission. People just leaving Gloria Vale in the last two or five years didn't know about it. So we had to go around a process of educating them that there was a Royal Commission, that the Royal Commission was interested in talking, that they were willing to send um, lawyers down to do interviews, was their interest. Firstly, it involved, do you know what abuse is? And most of them are like, well, not really. It's not really a concept. And then it involved giving them information on abuse and having them just tick sheets. And they're like, whoa, like that significantly my, explains my life. So it really began with quite a grassroots process. And then heaps of, more than 50, I think, leavers said, we will, yeah, we will speak. So the lawyers came down did their interviews, and then it was still a case of advocating, were, was Gloria Bell going to be specially mentioned, or was it just going to be rolled up in other high-demand groups? And we made a real case that Gloria Bell is a very unique scenario. So to have them included in one of the eight was quite um, an achievement. That's interesting, Liz, because um, to my knowledge, nobody did anything like that to get the exclusive brethren included. The brethren may believe that I did something like that, but I, I actually certainly didn't. And um, I, my understanding is just that it was the number of people coming mm. forward I who said that from the brethren um, that caused them to end up being included. But yeah. it, is a, it is an interesting question around who got specifically named and who didn't, because there are lots of I think people. it was that. I think it was just right. the top. It was just that these, wow. these names are just coming up over and over and over it again. Sense. We need to look closer. Because the exclusive brethren have thousands of people and tens of thousands over the decades of impacted people, whereas Gloria Vale is a much smaller group. And yeah. just because of their um, way they've been so isolated, they were never even going to find out about the Royal Commission, let alone jump through the hoops of signing up for it. And there were so many barriers in the way for people to do that. And and so indoctrinated to believe that their experiences were just normal, like without yeah. the facts about what's what's legal, what's acceptable socially, what's okay for a person to experience. Like, so there are a lot of barriers. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, so I did, I was one of the survivors who did testify to the Royal Commission and, um, yeah, the process, you know, they recorded it all and they take notes and that kind of thing and two people... Um, interview with you and I mean it is a daunting process but um they you you know just just on that note of not sometimes not even knowing that what you've been is abusive um one of the people who was interviewing me was a former police investigator and as I outlined one of my experiences in there um which was um around sexually abusive behavior um you know he said to me did you ever fill out a report with the police about this and I was like well no um I confessed it to the priest to the elders and you know and they they you know told me yes I was a sinner but I was you know you know um forgiven and whatnot but they never spoke of it as actually being criminal in nature um but actually due to my age it was and he said well well, you know, you can still file a police report now if you want to about this. Um, and yeah, there were two or three other incidents like that, um, mm -hmm. as I shared stuff, that just because there was a police, you know, I'd never sat down and spoken with a police person before. Um, and I was like, my goodness, I had no idea that this stuff is actually, mm -hmm. you know, criminally liable here. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, I'm like, I've been out for 15 years and, and I'm 35 and I'm reasonably well educated and, and mm -hmm. I still... You know, I haven't been living with my head under a rock no. and, you know, I still hadn't realised that some of this stuff was... But so, yeah, that's an example of it. It's the power of um, never telling your story, of your silence, the silencing of your story, that if, if it never gets light, mm -hmm. um, you don't ever get to kind of hmm, get that feedback from another person. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've been... I've heard I've heard some difficult stories in the last mm, six weeks or so from people who've survived different groups. And what I've noticed um, repeatedly is the shock that that that, that, ex that conversation then leads to from those individuals. Mm -hmm. This sort of like um, 
it's it's more than just the hardness of telling the story it's the confrontational nature of that um uh it's when when that that the person who's hearing it goes oh my goodness mm -hmm. you know that they, they kind of like set the standard of what is okay and what's not okay by their mm -hmm. response mm -hmm. by their um their their compassionate uh uh, informed in some ways response to what has been normalized as nothing in your own head by yeah. often the perpetrator unfortunately so like it's both a gift that compassion mm. and hugely confrontational because you have to reframe your experience mm. uh in a in a in a grossly different way which ultimately i think is better for you but in the moment it, it's a shock um mm. Mm. Yeah. you're right I think that's I, I remember that when you know we gave these sheets out and just said look here's four categories of abuse you know emotional psychological sexual physical neglect you know just tick have 10 minutes to just tick through private no one's going to read them just take them away with you it was just an opportunity for self-reflection which is a whole group of glory of our levers and that that was that was a shock they're like wow yeah that's all happened I just never knew there was a word for it I hadn't been able to categorize yeah. it Mm. So I, I also did a, a report as well, um, Lindy and Liz, I, I don't know if I've mentioned that before, I was actually in two different care institutions and reading, I've talked about the centre point one and, and how um, I went in the newspaper to try to encourage centre point survivors to come forward because it wasn't sort of traditionally viewed as faith based, yeah. even though it's very much a spiritual um community you know was it? yeah very much um and class themselves legally as a religion um so a lot of center points survivors i don't think even considered that that this right. would be something that they should put their hands up for mm -hmm. um but the other the other environment i was in was an anglican um home for children that um just reading the report in the last couple of days i hadn't even it was quite remarkable what that experience did for me to um read it wow. and go there were other children's homes across new zealand and they were run by the Anglican um, Trust, and many kids experienced harm there. And it's called Brett Home in Auckland. And I've never really spoken about it to anyone before, but just reading the report wow. actually did something really powerful for me. Um, and this is just the last two days. And like, it's really, really what what you mean by it did something powerful? Well, well, well. It, there was two things. One, I went. I might be one of these survivors. Okay. Um, in this regard, you know, in a way, I hadn't kind of thought. You know, I was, you know, left there when the family fell apart with my younger siblings and put into this kids' home that was terrifying, to put it mildly. Um, but just reading all these survivor stories about other children who were also abandoned, um, left to fend for themselves in this kind of. Lord of the Flies kind of environment where kids were just encouraged to um, find a top dog and hurt one another um, and neglected and um, frightened. Mm. It, it was really, it really, it was shocking, but it was also really affirming. Mm -hmm. um, and then it made me go and look on the internet and see if I can find some other people. And uh, I did find a little Facebook, um, mm. a little link that had some people going, yeah, I was there and, it's very affirming, you know. I, I didn't. It was real, you know. It was real. <laughs> it's something that I've um, since done. You know, it's a, over two and a half thousand pages. This report. There's a lot in it. So I went through and read it. it. Took me two, three days, and I scooped up and copied and pasted every element that uh, related to Glory Vale or anything around that could be relevant to Glory Vale. And then I'm condensing it, but it's still a hundred pages. And I'm condensing it even further and I'm highlighting things in red because I want to make it readily available for people who've left Glorivale or those who are still inside Glorivale. I want them to see the whole coherent picture of what's happened in Glorivale because there's um, workshops we went to over in Barcelona at the ICSA conference. They highlighted that leaving journey is about unmasking the group firstly, then it's about recognising the harm that's been done to you and then understanding the impact so that you can set yourself on a journey of healing and so it's just looking at all those stages, and I want to use that document as one of those documents to assist people to affirm for them that they this they're not alone. They've experienced this with other people. It's a natural response to trauma, the things that might be playing out in their lives now, and it's um, that there is a road for recovery that you can live mm. a, really, uh, a positive life after deep traumatic impacts. Mm. Yeah, I think I 
agree with you know what you guys have said that it is there's a deep validation to um recognizing and naming what some of this stuff is pulling it out of the closet and and yeah bringing it into the light as the report says i i've got a question just to jump us right back almost to the start again because i think it's you know a burning question we're called cult chat we're interested in groups that are culty um you know the word cult to my knowledge is not mentioned in this report <laughs> um you know where do we where do you guys see where do we see the overlap here and why do we think it's important um for people who are in cult-like groups or yeah why are we particularly interested in this report is there any kind of light it sheds in the culty sphere for us what's the overlap what what do you guys have to say about that yeah definitely i noticed that um even though they didn't use the word cult, there was a lot of familiar language around the high control um, groups that, you know, um, are all consuming in their attempts to control people's thinking, their feeling, the erosion of self and identity, the institutionalization process. And that's actually what cults do. They are a form of institutionalization. They use their ideology to do it. And so it was very clear reading this that the Royal Commission fully understood, A, the mechanics at play that play into how cult groups move ahead and that cult groups are filled with abuse and the Royal Commission understands the uh, preconditions for abuse, the impacts of abuse, and then they really hone in on groups that socially isolate, groups that shun, the damage that's done psychologically. And they made an, an amazing comment and a recognition of um, the way that psychological and emotional abuse actually sets the scene in many ways for all of the other kind of abuse. And cults just do that on steroids. So they were definitely um, using words around the high control sphere, which was, yeah. Yeah, what I noticed, I mean, like, obviously not all, I mean, I well, not obviously, but I don't know if just being named as being high, um, you know, um, groups that had high levels of complaints from that particular group, like those top eight, I don't think that necessarily means they're cults, no. but it certainly means that they have some uh, system issues um, and some context issues and maybe some uh, beliefs uh, that set them up for not taking care of the most vulnerable people in society. Um, for instance, things like lack of oversight and accountability in a complaints process. I mean, those things are all very much present in cults. You know, the same thing. So, like they, they kind of they're like the they're like the Venn diagram, the the two circles mm. that overlap. They're not they're not all the same, but they overlap so much. Some of them are the same. Others aren't. They're on the edges of the two circles or three circles, and that you wouldn't say one is exactly the same as the other, but they look a lot like each other. Yeah. Um, yeah. So things like, well, how they respond to to apologising, and what are they going to do now? You know, oh, like, yeah, 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 yeah. We'll come to that later. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Linda, you you were going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say that um, for people who are interested, probably more in this particular thing, checking out the report that is on. Um, faith-based entities there's a, and there's a summary of that as well I think I think that has got you know we, we've discussed here before that just because you're a religion or you're a faith-based entity yeah as we've said it doesn't mean you are a cult and yet um, it is also true that most cults or cult-like groups have got a form of faith or spirituality as part of their beliefs not if you're a multi-level marketing cult or maybe you're a political cult but usually there is a spirituality and a faith-based element to to your group and um, therefore also to the ways in which you um, hold power over people and therefore if you're going to be abusive and controlling and weird you're also probably going to use your religion or your spirituality to do that as well it's your and, weapon yeah and I think it is of interest to note that all of those eight groups that were investigated were based in the Christian religion um you know, which is, you know, some people might say, you know, there you go, it's, um, you know, the problem's Christianity. I'd I'd probably say that the, the reason why is um, hugely to do with just, as Kaz pointed out earlier, that, you know, Christianity has been the dominant religion in New Zealand. There's um, so many different Christian-based groups, and some of them are huge uh, numerically as well as financially and all that kind of thing. So it does make sense, I think, that that's reflected 
in this report that um, yeah, these top eight groups that came to the forefront were Christian based, as well as some of the ideas in Christianity that can loan themselves to um, to being abused, like concepts of submission and of respecting authority. The, the Royal Commission actually got it. They said in their report, Howard Temple, the overseeing shepherd of Gloravale, acknowledged the Gloravale doctrine of unity made it difficult for members to raise concerns around abuse. So they actually pulled out some threads of their specific doctrine. Um, but just going back to the, um, you know, large numbers of Christian groups that were looked at, you're right, Christianity, there's a huge amount of generosity of heart and spirit. You, a lot of your Christian charities have had a Christian basis, even think of World Vision, Red Cross. There's a lot of these who have had a heart to serve people and do the best. Clearly, there were some terrible, terrible things that have, have happened, but um, the government has not traditionally been in the sphere of um, doing the most bulk of charity work in our country at all. It never has. It's always come out of um, other grassroots community organisations and, and kind-hearted people. But I found it interesting, yeah, just the, um, the, the Jehovah Witnesses one in particular, you know, they got included in this, but they fought tooth and nail to get out. Remember the High Court uh, they went to the High Court to try and get out of it, and they lost it all. And then they, in the last minute, they tried to get name suppression so that the Jehovah Witnesses were not named in the report. They lost that. And I just read this week they've been forced to pay $48,000 in legal fees um, because they tried to fight the, the Royal Commission about their inclusion in this report. So they'll have mm. to pay up. Yeah, and that you know that really is fascinating. And and faith based entities, whether they're Christian or not, up and down the country, should be taking huge note of that because yeah, essentially they were trying to say, hey, we didn't have formal care of those, whether it was um you know going evangelizing in peers or whether it was a youth group or whether it was even a working bit at the church property, mm -hmm. and, and the court ruled and said no, that is a care relationship. And they were, um, I went and sat in on some of them down here at the High Court in Wellington, and they were incredibly fascinating to, to see the two narratives at play, to see the Jehovah's Witness side trying to get out of it, trying to justify it. Um, a really common thing that groups do when they're trying to wriggle out of being held accountable is to say, oh, no, it was the parents' choice. And yeah. they were under parents' care while they were at the working bee mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. And the court went, no, if there is a pastoral care relationship and there's somebody who's seen as a religious figure with authority and influence mm. over that family and, uh, and over their decisions and over their children, then it is a pastoral care relationship. So, mm. you know, I think, actually, I think churches and faith-based institutions up and down the country should be really sitting up and taking notice of that because essentially the court was saying you can be held liable for care relationships that are happening under your roof. And I celebrate that, I affirm that. I think churches have been way too lax mm -hmm. with um, with their boundaries and with their care of people. And, you know, um, I'll bring it up here because I'd love to read some of it actually, but um, under the transcript when they delivered it in parliament, there's really good speech was made and the transcript's available um, on the Abuse and Care website as well. But, you know, I'd love to just read a couple of paragraphs of what where they called out some of this stuff that happened on, in these faith-based communities. They said, um, faith-based institutions, and again, I'm highlighting this because of its relevance to high control groups. Mm. Um, faith-based institutions had some unique factors that contributed to abuse and neglect in their care. And you listen to these factors, because again, they are completely relevant for any culty group. Um, it, they said the assumed moral authority and trustworthiness mm. of leaders allowed abusers in these institutions to perpetrate abuse and neglect with impunity. So I had to Google what impunity meant because I didn't know. And it means um, without without getting punishment, mm. without having punishment. So mm. it's saying that assumed moral authority and trustworthiness of leaders allowed abusers to perpetrate their abuse and their neglect with impunity. Religious beliefs were often used to justify the abuse. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it's okay if we're, you know, doing X, Y, Z, if we're socially isolating you, if we're physically beating you, all that kind of thing, because of our religious beliefs. So religious or beliefs it's part of the part of the but religious religious belief. It's doing you good. Yes. And they're right. calling on religious freedom. They're saying this is part of my religious belief and religious freedom to express my faith. That's right. And, you know, at centre point, 
you know, that meant having sex with minors. Like to, you mm. know, to, mm. it's like exactly. Hang on. exactly. We believe this, and therefore it's justified. And yes. we're better, we're actually better than the rest of society, oh. and we look down on their um closed, you know, their closed eyes. Mm. Yeah. So religious beliefs do have, you know, they do mm. have limits when they're breaching other human rights. Mm. Um, and it said, yeah, these religious beliefs were used to silence survivors. Yeah. Um, hierarchical and opaque decision-making processes impeded scrutiny and making complaints. Senior mm. leaders often sought to protect their own reputations mm -hmm. and, and that of the institutions they were responsible for. Yes. Few, few and, put, incidences... and put a lot of money into it as well. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Few incidences were reported to appropriate authorities like the police. Mm -hmm. um, and faith-based care settings abuse was often treated as a religious transgression that simply required survivors to forgive, let go of anger and blame, mm -hmm. and even embrace those who had sinned against them. Mm -hmm. And for abusers to merely repent as opposed to actually having um, legal accountability. Mm -hmm. um, and, well, yeah. and, and maybe didn't have any other consequences beyond that. That's that's right, and it goes on to talk about how they were, abusers were often relocated and, and that kind of thing and went on abusing. It says um, separation from whānau, being told that no one loved them, sometimes from a young age, deprived children of their right to be loved and develop positive attachments. Um, yeah, and it, it goes on to talk about... So and th these are all um, things that are relevant from the faith-based survivors as well as the state-based mm. ones. It talks about, you know being unable to fulfill their potential, unable to go out on with their lives and form stable, secure relationships, jobs, having health conditions, having Financi huge financial setbacks. Huge and financial a big long list of all the impacts for abuse and care. And I'm like, wow, this is all the same impacts that we find cult leaders um, have. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. It, you know, survivors being triggered, emotional impacts, leaving survivors feeling fuck and ma or shame, eroded self confidence, leading to self harm, suicidal ideation, substance misuse. Like it just goes on and the on. Trauma. They're talking about the impacts of trauma. And mm -hmm. this is what we need to recognize is that cult groups create this sort of trauma that people inside these other institutions. Um, also suffered. Um, yeah, that's right. Like, listen to this paragraph. Some survivors suffered trauma when they left their faith because of abuse and neglect. For some, leaving their church community also meant losing their family, friends, and job. Some survivors left voluntarily, but others told the inquiry they were excommunicated or forced to leave, mm -hmm. shunned, disfellowshipped, blocked from seeing their family. These impacts were a complete loss of identity, mm -hmm. of community, of physical and financial assets, and were emotionally devastating. Mm. That, that is a summary of what it's like to leave a high demand or a cult-like group. A complete, mm. a complete loss of identity and community, emotionally mm. devastating. What's incredible is just to have it all here wrapped up in succinct paragraphs that we can now use to advocate and send them to other groups. And as we sort of come into this last sort of part of our, our chat here tonight, I think it's probably worth looking at. They were quite specific where they actually found fault in, with particular groups in particular areas. So, of course, for me, the area of Gloria Vale, that it made some quite um, bold fault statements that we, you know, they allowed physical and sexual abuse to happen. They failed to address it which perpetuated a cycle of harm. They failed to prevent and protect survivors in the community. They responded to allegations of abuse, seeking repentance from the offender and forgiveness from the victim. They failed to recognize the pattern of harm on survivors, and are still, they're still failing there. Failing to deal with perpetrators of abuse correctly, allowing them to continue living in the community. Uh, failing to recognize the scale and extent. Dealing with complaints of abuse themselves. And then finally, the role the community's doctrines had in creating a culture that allowed abuse to occur. And I want to take that and say, Gloriabelle still holds those same like general yeah. doctrines today. Like, and then they go on to say that soon there will be these apologies given. Yeah. Something that we spoke to the Prime Minister about and a number of the MPs when we had our reception there. You're actually talking about a group that still exists today. You're talking about a group that have had some of their dirty washing aired, and so they're making some changes and promises in that area. But inherently, this group still has the dangerous belief patterns. And what I found amazing about the Royal Commission is they said, and this one utterly blew me away, one of their recommendations, you know there were 132 recommendations 
Um, one of them is that institutional environments and practices to be minimized and ultimately eliminated. And I read that and I kept reading and they want these kinds of institutions where there's conformity, rigid routines, um, where people have little influence or control over their lives. They're saying they need to be eliminated. And I'm thinking, <laughs> how are they going to do that in the context of Gloria Bale? And also the, um, the report really pointed out that our whole sort of government, police and state had failed to make meaningful difference, even if they did monitoring and oversight, it wasn't enough to stop the harm. They're basically saying oversight and monitoring of these groups is a failure. We shouldn't actually have these groups. And I'm thinking in the context of Gloria Bale, the multi-agency oversights that have mm -hmm. gone on in the last few years have just done nothing but waste time, allow a group that just wants to protect its reputation to do that more and more, offering promises, which uh, really we should be reading this report and realising it's very serious when you have children still mm. living in trauma zones every day, living right next door to or in the same room as your abusers. It's psychologically traumatic. We've got to do something better for the people at Gloria. What, what, it, what it says, what it does, I remember that whole thing from Judith Herman talking about trauma being also as much the event as the abandonment of the community. So abandonment by the community and lack of control to escape the experiences. So if you can control your experience, you're less likely to, to, to go on to experience trauma. But if you are, are protected by the people in around you and looked after and you know like and so staying in the same community with a perpetrator who's been given no significant consequences um, that happened at Centre Point, you know, like they got out of jail, these perpetrators, and they came back into the community, and that's where the kids were. I was like, wow, what does that say? But then it grew up, there's physical offenders in there, people who just beat boys left and right and centre in the work area, even though they've yeah. got some charges laid, guess where they're living? They're still living up there on the hostel, whatever number. It, I just, yeah, I, I, think, I think that that highlights you know, one issue, as much as this, it's incredible to have this report and I really, you know, support the work that's gone in and it, it is going to serve to bring about some change. Um, it is also worth highlighting, you know, that there's profound inadequacies within it. There, there, there's still so much that was not included um, and there's so much, you know, it, it's worth noting that even though the report's there, it actually doesn't have the teeth to deliver the change so, you know, yeah. subsequent governments have got to actually agree and put time and money and resource into these recommendations. And some of them will take decades, probably, to properly implement. Um, you know, they've, they've, people have started work on a couple of the recommendations. Like one of the things that they've started working on is a website that is going to enable people to access their records that have been kept of them, especially when they've been in multiple agencies or under the care of multiple entities. And that's mm -hmm. fantastic and really important because there's that's been really hard for people to get hold of in the past. So there's some things they're going to be able to do. But um, um, the ability for financial compensation, there's massive work going on. And there's actually a whole cross-party government approach working towards working through the recommendations. It's going to take them a long time to work through 132 oh. and decide what they're going to do, how they're going to do it. Well, yes, but I also, like, you know, I could just be being a down buzz, but I don't think I am. I know the reality that many of these groups and institutions and their leaders are going to fight tooth and nail to not be included um, or to wriggle out of accountability. They're already wriggling out of apologies, um, something as basic as an apology, let alone a redress scheme. Like there is, you know, there is, there is, I, I just I just can't ever see a redress scheme, for example, happening for former members of the Plymouth Brethren Christian well, Church or if, witnesses if was... because they don't believe they've done anything wrong. They believe that shunning people and psychologically and spiritually abusive behaviour is their God-given and divinely sanctioned right. There's no way they're going to apologise for it or oh. give people money for doing it. If, if their income is tied to it, it might have an impact. If like charity, if they, status. charity service status, yeah, exactly. That, that yeah. has a huge impact. Do you know what's worse than an apology? An apology yeah. from a group when it's insincere, no, no. disingenuous, carefully crafted by master PR as an exercise to just shut people up. You know what? Gloria had given an apology and leavers disrespect it immensely. And I'm sitting there going, 
they're actually been told in this report to give an apology. Laura Bell is listed there. Mm -hmm. The overseeing shepherd Howard Temple has to deliver an apology within six months. And I'm like, no, I don't think you should have written that in as a recommendation. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to hear it while Gloria Bell is in the state it's in, while their people are still pleading not guilty for things and going to trials and have it. I don't think an apology is going to be well received. Well, yeah. I think Unless it's real and genuine. And until they stop talking about persecution and start yeah. talking about prosecution, and that's Virginia, um, Virginia Courage's quote. I'll know when Gloria Bell's changed, she said. It's when they stop talking about persecution and start talking about prosecution. Yeah. Until that happens, I don't think anyone wants to hear an apology, quite frankly. Yeah, so I think, you know, the point of what we're saying to our listeners is that um, high control groups or, yeah, or groups that have got a very strong internal narrative that sits differently to the narrative that the rest of society, even a state, might hold about them. Um, you know, they they're going to be very, very resistant to being held accountable, very resistant to being scrutinised, mm -hmm. very, very resistant to actually um, dealing with the abuses of people under their care. Mm -hmm. It's this. This is not going to be an issue that's going to be tidied up and fixed. Um, no by this report or or by even the recommendations being tried to be put into place, no. unfortunately. Yeah, and it highlights to me, like, we, there was only, I think it was about 800 people who gave testimonies in the faith-based care section, and the remainder, two, 3,000, whatever it was, were not in that scenario. And we were talking before about um, Christian groups and um, the fact that it was all Christian groups were listed in the top eight. What I wanted to say then was, but what about the two and a half thousand people who were talking about state situations? So situations where vulnerable people should have been cared for, cared for who were treated much the same way as people are treated in culty groups. So what is going on in society that society is not just tolerating their most vulnerable people, their deaf people, their blind people, their children, their disabled, their LGBTQ plus uh, people being desperately mistreated and just closing their eyes to it. Um, so it's all about a failure to recognise coercive of control in action and what, because that's the, that's actually the sameness that we've got here. We're saying, oh, yes. well, why are they, which bits of this the same as cults? Well, what it is, is all throughout those institutions that were state-based, faith-based, culty groups that aren't even part of this mm -hmm. report, what is the same, what is the unifying theme is coercive control, power over when mm -hmm. some a dominating person or organisation um, uh, oppresses uh, weaker people and, mm -hmm. and um, yes. put systems around themselves to keep themselves safe at the cost of the vulnerable. And they use the word enslavement. In the Royal Commission report, the word mm -hmm. enslavement was there. Uh, that really just struck yeah. me. Look, in that last uh, sort of five minutes yeah. that we've got, I'm um, wondering, one of the big recommendations is that actually there's a whole overhaul of the agency approach in New Zealand to Orana Tamariki and Kia. So they're looking for a whole new ministry, really, of, um, of Kia. And so they've proposed this group and how it might operate. So that's that's huge. That would That's going to take a lot of working through. And so I, I, I don't know, is our country brave enough to have a complete and utter overhaul of, of the way we the way we care? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but I know that we can do our little bit in this end of the world to speak up for those inside culty groups who need, um, who need better care. But yeah, we've got a whole systemic issue in our society. So whew, where do we go from here? Yeah, where do we go from here? I mean, well, I'd, I'd be kind of going, well, what would be the take-homes that you two would have and what I might have for this? What have we learned? What what do we think we'll remember? Um, what do we want to communicate as our final point? Lindy? Yeah, I mean, the the report, you know, finishes with this vision for the future, the um, he mara tipu, the... Um, which means a growing garden like the ideas for how do we bring about that thriving and redemption and and some positive things going on here and there, there are lots of beautiful beautiful ideas and concepts and there you know like what um Liz has just mentioned around an independent safeguarding agency and that sort of thing but they also yeah really affirming again um the place for well they've got three key recommendations to the report to the report um 
three key themes is righting the wrongs of the past, and that's doing the whole apologies thing, making the justice system safer. And then there's a whole focus on making care more safe, and that that includes this independent safeguarding agency. It also means making or attempting to make faith-based entities and their leaders to abide by the same laws and rules and accountabilities mm -hmm. as everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, and they've also specified they're having a safe and well-trained workforce, which I was really pleased to see, you know, given even things like the training that we're doing soon with mental health therapies or CARES, your advocacy in the um, medical profession mm -hmm. for people to be better trained. Um, and lastly, I guess, you know, I am always interested in, in this area here, but, you know, the third area was around how do we empower communities? How do we empower, you know, Joe and Jane blogs and, and their local neighbourhood and, and your own home to do a better job? And I'm always interested in that, I think partly because I do feel so powerless so often um, and I'm so aware of that actually, you know, sometimes the biggest and the best thing I can do might just be to, to show some care to my next door neighbour. And, oh. and like, But yeah, and it and under that, it talks about giving everyone in New Zealand the knowledge and the tools to prevent mm. abuse and neglect. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I love that because I'm again I'm like, that's one of Cult Chat's goals. Like we want to give people more knowledge and tools to recognize and to prevent abuse and neglect, to see it when it's going on, to, yeah, and, and, and to help. And to not just turn a blind eye. Because mm. I think that, I think so much that's in this report, like as I was reading it, I often wanted to put it down and just, yeah. It's, it's hard. It's hard to go there. And I think that without that decision to go there for the greater good, to expose yourself to these awful truths, um, we'll just continue to look after our own. And, and we need to be a society that actually sees the vulnerable and the weak and protects them. So, I agree. Parliament actually made, someone made that point in Parliament on that day. They said, spread this far and wide. We want everybody across New Zealand to read this report and I think it does have a profound impact on you. I guess one of my takeaways is the report did have one single recommendation for Gloria Bale which said the government should take all practicable steps to ensure the ongoing safety of children, young people and adults in care at Gloria Bale and I thought wow there's a succinct little one line sentence in 132 recommendations which will take years and decades enormous amount of resources just simply put there and unless we keep having these discussions in the marketplace that little line could easily be deleted and people mm -hmm. walk all over the other recommendations and implement them and someone said to Rosanna Overcomer it was one of the local the one of the MPs in parliament said to her you need to hold us to this in other words, you know, we're just fallible MPs with a heavy workload. They actually require the advocacy groups to keep advocating. Our job is not over, everybody. The report's been written. It's just like part one. Our it's job like, yeah. is not over. It's like me making you two do cold chat because you're so busy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a lovely place to end. We've run out of time today. And... um. We just want uh, to thank all our listeners for sticking with us. And um, we don't want you to forget about Decult coming up in October. We hope there's something that there's been for you in today's episode which might help you to cult-proof your life. Please keep listening to our various different uh, platforms of where Cult Chat can be found on Plains FM, Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Thank you so much to Plains FM for supporting us and all the work that mm -hmm. we do and the work that you do. You can also listen to us on the YouTube channel as well. You can find additional information about this episode in the show notes on Apple Podcast, and please consider liking us on our Facebook page or any of these platforms. Tell your friends, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Ka kite anō. Bye, everyone. See you next time. If anything in today's episode was difficult or upsetting for you and you would like to talk to somebody, we encourage our New Zealand listeners to free call or text 1737 for support from a trained counsellor. Or you might like to visit the resources section of the Olive Leaf Network website where you can find a range of organisations and resources that might be able to support you. We would also like to remind you that the views and thoughts and opinions that have been expressed in this programme are the speakers alone and Cult Chat does not necessarily endorse or share them. 